Okay, so he gives some really specific examples of this that I think are important. Um, so he talks specifically about uh, the sound clash culture in Jamaica. He also talks about disco culture in New York City. And then he talks also about uh, hip hop culture, also, also from New York City. And all these things, you know, we're talking about late 1960s, early 1970s, which was, you know, in my opinion, these music forms um, were the first, I, I would say, uh, forms of that became popular culture where, where very, very, you know, patently obvious remixing was at the core of their creativity and they embraced that as their core, but then these things went on to be, become popular culture. And I think that's really important to me. If you think of, you know, uh, reggae, dance hall music, just so globally important and influential, hip hop music and culture, so crazily uh, important and influential and financially uh, marketable. And then maybe you're like, oh, whatever, disco. But if you listen to any sort of electronic dance music, broadly define that to house, techno, um, you know, quote unquote EDM, dubstep, all that stuff, that all has, has its origins in actually um, the New York City disco techs of the late 1960s and early 1970s. So when he talks about um, the Jamaican sound class system uh, in the 60s, um, you got to understand in Jamaica, um, the beat or the instrumental or what, what they call the rhythm is, is like more important than the MC or the person singing over the rhythm. So the producer it has, has a higher sort of status. And so what happens is when like a new reggae rhythm drops or dance hall rhythm drops, you know, you have one artist that gets on it and then you'll have like 10 or 11 other artists that do their own version of a song o over that rhythm. But um, anyways, the Jamaican sound clash culture is kind of the, you know, what you had, you had these people, you know, building their own like crazy walls of, of sound of speakers, right? And they would battle other DJs and the DJs at, in Jamaica are called selectas. And then the person who gets on the microphone is called um, a DJ. It's kind of confusing, but a select is someone who selects records or whatever. And so DJs would get, you know, get together. Um, the selectors would get together in the tenement yards or get, you know, in places in Jamaica. They set up their sound systems. And then, you know, it was about a battle, right? Like who would win and you had, you know, who had the loudest sound system and then who had like the most exclusive rhythms or music. And what you had was a lot of records that would come out, um, you know, on the A side would be like, you know, the, the rhythm with um, someone singing over it or, or, or whatever. And on the B side would be the dub version. It would be an instrumental version with maybe like a heavier bass line or something like that. So at these sound clashes, you'd have uh, the select to play a rhythm and then they'd have someone get on the mic, the DJ get on the mic and they would do what they'd call toast, which was basically like disses, singing, being lyrical, kind of like rhyming a little bit, um, etc. cetera, that, um, you know, and, that, and the, the winner was determined about like, you know, who had the rarest records and who could, um, you know, had the best DJs toasting, you know, and so they try to diss and toast, you know, roast the opponents and then the loudest system. And, you know, um, all that is so predicated on, on remixing and, and um, if you look at the origins of Jamaican uh, dance hall and reggae, it's, it's, it's largely a sort of glocalized version of, of, um, of uh, American soul and R&B music and uh, ska and stuff like that. Um, but like this is so important because it also went on to influence, um, you know, in so many ways, uh, New York City, South Bronx, um, a lot of the early hip hop DJs like DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, they all had origins um, in the Caribbean. So uh, Cool Herc, you know, he was, he's largely credited as the first um, DJ to, uh, in the United States to isolate the break. So basically what Herc would do is uh, he started throwing parties in the early 1970s and 
he was looking for exclusive records, you know, meaning like not stuff played on the radio. And he would find records that would have, you know, this like part of the record where it would be just drums. Like the drummer would get their break in the song. There would be maybe a bass line, but, or maybe some percussive elements, but no, no singer, no guitar, no horns or, or anything like that. And he noticed at his parties, once he started throwing his parties, mind you, he's like a teenager, right? Like 15 or whatever. He'd throw these parties and he'd play these songs and he'd noticed that when the drum break part would come on, what he called the get down, uh, people would literally get down to the floor and they go wild, you know, and like dancing. And then after that part would end, they kind of, you know, go back to dancing, you know, but not like wilding out. So he had this whole idea, he called it the merry-go-round, where he would just play that percussive part of records. He played just the percussive element, the get down part. And his idea was like, yo, I can make my parties like really pop off and, um, you know, people will get down, you know. And so the, the, the idea of like uh, break dancing, B-boys, B-girls, break boys, break girls, all came from his parties. Um, he, you know, so he, he was the first to like isolate a drum break, which, you know, then this dude, DJ Grandmaster Flash, figured out how to take two copies of the same record and... Uh, if you ever watch the Get Down on Netflix, you know, you see him using a crayon to mark his records like a clock. He figured out a way how to um, play like a drum break, like boom, cack, ba boom, ba boom, cack, right? It's just like literally just like a couple bars of a drum break and take two copies of the same record. And when, when the boom, cack, ba boom, ba boom, cack would end on one turntable, he'd drop it on the other turntable so you could hear it, boom. Cack, boom, 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 cack, spin it back, boom, cack, boom, you know. And you create basically an infinite loop um, of this, like, you know, six second drum break, four second drum break, he would, you know, using two turntables and a record. So this is like monumental, a lot of this, even the sound clash culture, because here we have, if we think back to early on in this class where we're thinking about John Philip Sousa and how, like, the talking machine would make us just passive dupes who would just listen to records and eat chips and drink soda. Here you have these cultures that are taking other people's music, right, taking records which you're supposed to just listen to, and they're manipulating them, and they're making new music and new culture out of it. Eventually in, in New York City with hip-hop, you know, that eventually a few years later, MCs came along, and then, and then by 1979, you know, they cut the first rap record, which tried to um, emulate what MCs and DJs were doing in New York City, and then obviously now it's, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, but, you know, it's predicated on this idea of the loop. So the concept of loop all comes from, from this. And then lastly, we have uh, disco music. Disco music comes from New York City in the late 60s from a primarily uh, gay, very diverse, um, but gay um, clubs in New York City um, where you would have DJs who would play funk, soul, uh, rock music, you know, and they would mix, you know, records together for these parties. And, um, you know, and they call, yeah, they call them disco techs, or, you know, and eventually discos. And, um, you know, they were playing everything on like little seven inch 45 records. Um, and these records were not intended to be mixed, you know, they were intended for radio. Singles at that time came out on seven inches and they were intended for radio. And um, so they were hard to mix, the, you know, mix them together. And the whole idea was to create this very seamless uh, transition between, between songs. So, um, you know, uh, so what ended up happening is as these started to become more prevalent, you started to have these studio DJs uh, that would take like a popular funky, funky soul song, boogie song or something that like a mainstream record label would go out would put out and they would uh, add like, you know, a one minute percussive sort of drum sound, drum loop to the beginning of the song. And then they would add like a breakdown in the middle and then they would add like, uh, you know, uh, an out loop, you know, again, like another one minute out loop. And they would cut these records to um, 45s, like seven inches, and they'd give them to, uh, you know, disco DJs in New York City. Um, and, 
what kind of came from that is two things. Um, by accident, a disco DJ went to you know cut one of his records uh, to give to DJs, and the cutting plant had run out of seven-inch blanks, and so uh, they cut it on a 12-inch, like an LP size, which actually was a huge innovation because it, it gave you know more low-end and bass, more information you could put on the the disc. Um, and so, in many ways, the 12-inch vinyl single was invented by DJs and disco. And then what happens is after a few years of this gains popularity and you know, starts to um, move beyond being just a, a gay club thing and just being a club thing, uh, what you start to have is then the music industry notices two things. While, whoa, what... What, whose music are they partying to? Oh, they're partying to like whatever, Donna Summers, but we've never heard this version of it because it was made by someone else. So then they started to like, you know, well, maybe we could, maybe we could capitalize on this. So then you start to have disco music genre. That's where you start to get the Bee Gees and you start to get, you know, the village people and some, you know, Saturday Night Fever and all that stuff. It's the exploitation of, of disco culture, but they really... You know, the culture is based upon remixing, you know, music for people to, um, to party to. And then eventually the music industry came along and fucked it all up and <laughs> ran it dry and, and made it kind of the cheesy mainstream bullshit um, that we make fun of. But um, the whole concept really and the style and the types of parties really um, paved way for early house uh, music, techno uh, music, jungle, uh, dubstep, you know, and then EDM. It's all kind of based on on a lot of these remixing practices that these, um, you know, bedroom DJs and, and disco tech DJs would, would partake in.